tonight, though, we are going to visit virtually uh, downtown Detroit's magnificent movie palaces. Our speaker, he's got a background in retail and in nonprofit, so business, um, nonprofit, it's very um, the jack of all trades a little bit. <laughs> um, Michael Hauser, he actually works for the Michigan Opera Theater, which works out of the Detroit Opera Theater, so he is the authority on this topic. Um, so I'm going to shut off the music and the slideshow, and we'll turn this over to Michael Hauser. Please help me welcome him. Hey, good evening, everyone. Good evening. And thanks for coming out on a cold, blustery evening. We're all going to share in a couple of records tonight, too. Record cold and uh, certainly snowfall. So <laughs> Detroit has always been at the forefront of the film industry. Um, we're going to take some time later on, too, so you can share your memories, too, uh, of your favorite theaters. Um, Detroit's first theater district was actually on Monroe Street, where CompuWare headquarters is today. That block of Monroe between Woodward and Randolph, there were about a dozen theaters on that block. And that block is where the first movies were unspooled, the first operettas, uh, the first vaudeville the first symphonic sounds, so a very important uh, street in our history. Uh, the first movies actually were unspooled on single reels at the original Opera House, which stood right where CompuWare is on Campus Martius. And that theater, of course, was built in the 1860s, burned in the 1890s, was completely rebuilt, um, and then flourished right up until the Depression. Uh, wasn't able to really sustain itself because of the Depression. Uh, interestingly enough, that theater was operated by both the Schuberts and the Niederlanders on a 100-year lease. And the Schuberts and the Niederlanders, even to this day, are still the two largest presenters of Broadway entertainment in this country. The Schuberts actually came back to Detroit in the 1935 to produce opera at Old Tiger Stadium back when it was Briggs Stadium, and it was called Opera Under the Stars. They actually had lights for nighttime opera before there were lights for nighttime baseball. <laughs> but nobody ever thought that film movies would ever be able to compete with or supplant all those other art forms, opera, symphony, vaudeville. The public proved everybody wrong. And those early theaters on Monroe Street simply weren't big enough to accommodate the crowds. Uh, they also weren't very comfortable. Uh, HVAC, heating, air conditioning, really wasn't a part of the mix back then. So the air that you breathed in those theaters was not good at all. Uh, of course, they didn't have concessions. Uh, so that district started to move to Grand Circus Park in the late teens, 1917 and 1918, with the opening of the Adams Theater and the Madison Theater both of which opened within six months of each other. And these were really deluxe houses compared to what was on Monroe Street. These were 1,800 seat theaters, uh, both built in a neoclassical style of architecture. Then along in 1922 came the Capitol Theater. Some of you knew it as the Broadway Capitol. Uh, some of you may have known it as the Grand Circus. Some of you may have known it as the Paramount. And today, of course, it's the Detroit Opera House. And that was a theater that nobody had ever seen the likes of before. About 5,000 people lined up in Grand Circus Park on a cold January night to get into that theater because of its opulence. Uh, Charles Howard Crane was the architect. He had studied the opera houses of Europe, which was his inspiration for that theater. So it was all done in an Italian Renaissance style of architecture. Uh, and seated roughly 4,000. Then in the mid-1920s, with the success of those three theaters, the, the Palm State opened. Um, and then you also had the Michigan open, which was 4,000 seats. Palms was 3,000 seats. Then in 1927, the Oriental, which is one, one that a lot of people tend to forget about. It was also known as the RKO Downtown Theater. It was operated by Howard Hughes. That was a 3,000 seat palace in the Oriental style. Um, the only thing that exists from that theater, the auditorium was demolished in 1952, is part of the original lobby, which was uh, actually constructed along with an adjoining hotel. Some, a few of the chandeliers from that, auditor from that lobby of the Oriental actually were saved are in, are in the inner lobby of the Redford Theater today. 
So, and then in 1928, that was a real pivotal year in Detroit's history because we were literally doubling our population. That year, the Penobscot building opened, the Fisher building opened, the Buell building opened, the Guardian building opened, the Fisher Theater opened, the Fox Theater opened, the Gem and the Century Theaters opened, the United Artists Theater opened. So Detroit was just going crazy. Um, and by the end of 1928, you had over 26,000 seats surrounding Grand Circus Park in about a dozen picture palaces. Plus the other theaters too. There were still a few theaters still operating on Monroe Street. And then you had a couple of grind houses on Michigan Avenue. When I say grind house, these were 24 seven types of operations that uh, pretty much showed a lot of action type pictures. There was the Times Square Theater and also the Loop Theater, which were sort of in the shadow of the um, phone company building. And then farther up Woodward, just north of the Fox, you had another little district, too, of grind houses, too. Some of you might remember the Colonial Theater or the Roxy Theater, um, the Mayfair, which today is the Bunstall Theater, uh, the Fine Arts Theater, or about a half a dozen theater, the Garden Theater, which actually just reopened uh, this past fall for concerts. Um, so you had between those two districts, then if you include Masonic Temple and Orchestra Hall, I mean, you were talking about 36,000 seats just in the greater downtown area. So we were blessed with some of the biggest theaters ever built in this country. And of course, as a result of our streetcar network at the time, all those streetcars that were running out Woodward and Gratiot and Grand River and Michigan Avenue, you developed corners where there was a lot of retail. Um, and of course, following retail were, of course, theaters. So we had some of the biggest neighborhood houses ever built as well. Um, if you're an East Sider, you probably remember the Ramona on Gratiot at Six Mile, over 2,000 seats. Uh, west side, you had the Redford at Grand River and Losser, of course, which is still open today, a little over 2,000 seats. Uh, you had the Riviera at Grand River and Joy, over 2,000 seats. The Riviera was so successful when it first opened in the late 20s that they actually had to build another theater just south of it called the Riviera Annex Theater. And then you had the Hollywood Theater on Fort Street, Fort at Ferdinand. That was over 3,000 seats. And that was built because, you know, back then the city fathers felt that the axis of the city would be moving in a southwestward direction. That's another reason why Michigan Central Station was built where it was too. And of course, uh, Roosevelt Park in front of it and uh, Grand Boulevard and Michigan Avenue, that was gonna be a, a circus, sort of like Grand Circus Park. Circuses were areas where large avenues would all come together. This was part of LaFlante's plan for Detroit. He also developed a plan for Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, our plan never was fully developed, which is another reason why Outer Drive throughout the city never really connects with itself. But so we had all these great theaters. Um, today, we're lucky we have half a dozen of these theaters that have all been restored. They've been repurposed as primarily performing arts centers. Of course, the Fox does a little bit of everything, Broadway, pop concerts, special events. Uh, the Palm State is operated today, it's called the Fillmore Theater because um, Live Nation, which is one of the largest presenters of concerts in this country, uh, leased that theater about five or six years ago. And the Fillmore name is what they use to brand their theaters here in Detroit, San Francisco, Denver, Seattle, Philadelphia. Um, opera House, of course, opera, uh, classical dance, large-scale Broadway, special events. Music Hall does a little bit of everything also, jazz, uh, gospel, contemporary dance, special events. And of course, the Gem and the Century have done a, a lot of off-Broadway since they opened. Right now, they're focusing on special events and weddings at the Gem and the Century. So, so we're really lucky to have these. There aren't that many cities around the country that have a concentration of theaters uh, in a neighborhood like, like we have in our, in our theater district. Pittsburgh, uh, obviously New York and, and Los Angeles. Seattle has a smaller district. Uh, Cleveland, of course, has Playhouse Square with five theaters on one block. So, so we're really lucky to have these. 
Um, we were also one of the few cities in the country to have a building devoted to the film industry, and that was the Film Exchange Building. There's a little binder up here with some photos and stuff I've included. And that was built on Cass Avenue, directly behind the Fox Theater. And that is where the exhibitors, the folks who owned the theaters, would go to screen the films. There was a screening room up on the seventh floor. They would screen these pictures in advance to see what pictures that they want to put into their theaters. They also would go to that building to get their heralds, anything to sell the picture. Uh, eight by 10 glossies for uh, the media, uh, press books, posters, things like that. That building also for a number of years housed branch offices of all of the studios. Because for many, many years, right on up into the 1970s, the studios, the Hollywood studios, had branch offices in a number of cities throughout the country. That building was sort of the nucleus of that. Um, some of the studios built their own buildings. Now Paramount built a building just south of Masonic Temple that for a number of years has housed the Michigan Chronicle newspaper. Uh, it even still has the original screening room in it. They use it for a meeting room today. Universal Pictures had built its own building on Elizabeth Street. And 20th Century Fox had built its own building on Cass Avenue too. Unfortunately, that building was demolished two years ago. So by the 1960s, that all started to move out to Southfield. Southfield sort of became the nucleus of the film industry locally. So Greenfield and Nine Mile was sort of like nirvana for all the studio branch offices. Uh, and a lot of the screenings took place out there too at the point of view screening room. And they would also do screenings at the Americana Theater. But by the 1970s, it pretty much became a New York, Los Angeles type of business and these branch offices closed throughout the country. The building is quite interesting though. It's seven floors. Um, if you look at the entrance to the building, you will see a frieze above the entrance and it's the two Fox movie tone uh, newsreel makers with the camera. Uh, the building's been abandoned though, unfortunately, since the late 1970s and certainly has seen better days. Uh, so we've got a lot of great history. I've brought some things here too that feel free to take a look at too. These are all a number of things that have been found under balconies of a lot of the downtown theaters through the years. Uh, you can see how popcorn has changed, how candy has changed through the years. Concession has all, wasn't always a part of the mix in movie houses and certainly stage theaters. For many, many years, the mindset was that soda, candy, and popcorn belonged at circuses and carnivals and not at movie houses, and certainly not at live um, uh, theater studio, uh, theaters. Um, the old opera house, the only thing they served was Werner's ginger ale. You didn't start to see candy in theaters until the early 1940s. And that was early candy machines in the backs of lobbies, ushers hawking candy up and down the aisles. Mid-1940s, you started to see popcorn in theaters. Now, there was always a confectionery store, or today we'd call it a party store, on the same block as many of these theaters, so people were always sneaking it in anyway. Theater managers finally got smart and started to salt that popcorn. Well, we all know what happens then, right? We get a thirst quench. So by 1950, Coca-Cola was introduced to all these theaters. So it took almost a decade for this whole mix to unravel itself. Soda, candy, and popcorn. By 1950, they finally got it right. And of course, ever since then, you can't live without that revenue, uh, especially in the case of movie houses, because the rules have not changed. It, with, and that was back when we had single screen theaters. Today with multiplexes, it's actually easier because if you get a big picture, say a big popcorn picture, or a picture with legs, meaning it's gonna play for at least 12 weeks, well, the first four to six weeks of that picture, ten, you know, you're only keeping 10% of the gross. 90% of your gross is going back to the studio. So how are you gonna pay for your employees, heat, air, lights, security? And that's why we pay what we do for concession and why you're always coaxed to buy the combo meal, even though you never would be able to drink a Coke that big. <laughs> or a popcorn tub that big. <laughs> but it's a revenue source in order to keep the theater operating. 
Um, also, giveaways. Um, for many, many years, uh, things like Cinerama. If you went to Cinerama, you also got a nice playbill like this. Uh, Cinerama was also very smart in terms of marketing, too. They sent out postcards. You filled out a little uh, postcard when you came into the theater with your name and address, and that gave them a database for the future, for all those future Cinerama pictures. Now, in the early 1950s, 3D came into being, too. These are actual 3D glasses from the Fox Theater from 1952. Of course, they're a little different than the 3D glasses we have today. But 3D was another one of those gimmicks to get people to come back to the theaters. Because once television came in in the early 1950s, that movie going really declined significantly. And that was another reason why Cinerama was so popular too. It really helped bring back moviegoers to theaters. And we were the second city to ever have Cinerama. Cinerama debuted in New York City. Music Hall Theater downtown was the second Cinerama theater in the world, and also one of the most successful Cinerama theaters. And you have to remember, most of these Cinerama movies were actually travel logs, fancy travel logs, you know, for an hour and a half. And many of these Cinerama theaters didn't even have concessions. So think of how much more revenue they could have generated if they had concessions. But it was all about what was on that screen. And if you remember Cinerama, it was that huge curved screen. Now, in the case of Music Hall, they actually had to slice off the boxes in the auditorium to be able to accommodate that screen. And then, because it was all about the picture, everything had to be painted out. So all the ornamentation in the auditorium was painted out tan. And then you also had, remember, you had, you had three projection booths, and you also had surround sound, too. So all of that had to be added to the theater, too. Now, Music Hall opened as the Wilson Theater in 1928. It was built, as you know, by Matilda Dodge Wilson, who built Meadowbrook Hall. She loved movies. She loved stage plays. And she integrated both of those into that theater. And Music Hall had a number of premieres through the years, too. Detroit, uh, the Detroit premiere of Gone with the Wind was at Music Hall. For Whom the Bell Tolls was at Music Hall. Um, Music Hall was also selected to be one of the first theaters in the country to play Walt Disney's Fantasia back in 1939 as well. Um, Music Hall, sort of, it sort of petered out, and the symphony took it over in 1945. They renamed it Music Hall. But that only lasted about four years. They ran out of money and had to go back to Masonic Temple in 1949. The theater sat vacant. Uh, Mr. Gaskin purchased the theater. He thought he had a deal with the Schuberts to be able to put live theater into Music Hall. And he was on a trip to New York. The plan didn't gel the way it should have, or he wanted it to. On the plane back to Detroit, it just so happens that there were several Cinerama executives they were scouting the country looking for other theaters since Cinerama had become so successful in New York. They all got to talking and Mr. Gaskin said, well, you know, I've got this white elephant in Detroit, Music Hall Theater, why don't you come take a look at it? And they did and they felt that it would work and that's how we ended up with the second Cinerama Theater. Now, the old Cass Theater across from the Free Press uh, was renamed the Summit Theater after the cast no longer did stage plays. That was renovated into our second Cinerama Theater. However, the product that was shown there was not true Cinerama product. It was blowing up 70 millimeter films. Movies like 2001 A Space Odyssey, Grand Prix, things like that. And then that theater lasted up until the 1970s. The last Cinerama movie was actually produced in 1967, uh, which was how the West was won. World War II was also a real, a real significant time for the movie theaters, too. The movie theaters probably sold more war bonds for the war effort than anybody else other than Hudson's. And this is actually um, sort of a little diary of series bond ease that, that folks bought when they bought their war bonds at the Fox Theater back in the 1940s. 
We also had motion picture councils back then too, which were uh, sort of like the, the censors of their day too. Uh, and they would, uh, particularly the, the Catholic Council, always wanted to look at the pictures before they were released to, to the movie theaters. There, sometimes they had to make some cuts to the pictures. Sort of, if you ever saw Cinema Paradiso, the movie is, is sort of like that. Um, we were also one of the few cities to produce our own film magazine called Weekly Film News. If you look at these, they got them in here. This is back in the teens and into the 20s. And uh, this was John Kunsky, who operated most of the downtown theaters at the time. And speaking with a professor at the U of M, there was only one other city in the country that he knew of, and that was Pittsburgh, that produced a similar magazine like this. And what it was, it came out every week, and it talked not only about the movies that were coming out and the stars, but it talked about the theater itself, whether it was uh, the Fox or the United Artists, the Palms or the Adams, because each of these theaters had their own personality. You know, one theater would show action pictures, another theater would uh, focus on romance pictures. And of course, each of these theaters architecturally had its own style also. Uh, United Artist was Spanish Gothic. The Fox Theater was Siamese Byzantine Hindu with a little bit of deco. Uh, the Palms was... Uh, <laughs> Neoclassical, the Adams and the Madison were neoclassical. The Capitol was Italian Renaissance. The Gem and the Century were Mediterranean. Uh, the Music Hall was a little bit of Spanish Gothic slash Deco as well. So each of these theaters definitely had their own personality. John is graciously uh, going to help us with some video tonight too. So we're gonna th throw in the first one too. This was an exhibit that I did for the Historical Museum uh, on the movie palaces too. And some of what we've talked about, you'll see in here some images and uh, you'll also meet a few folks too. Detroit Historical Society presents Detroit, the real story. Detroit has always been at the forefront of film exhibition. From the early screenings of the first moving pictures at the former Detroit Opera House on Campus Martius, to the Casino Theater on Monroe Street, one of North America's earliest venues devoted to exclusively exhibiting films, Detroiters have long enjoyed great movies and great venues in which to view them. Without exaggeration, there must have been 50, 60 neighborhood theaters in Detroit. You pay one price, you can stay there all day, from 12 o'clock noon to 12 o'clock midnight. But the theater was worth the price of admission alone, you know. Theaters in downtown Detroit were initially concentrated along Monroe Street near Campus Martius and after 1919 were clustered around Grand Circus Park. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, Detroit's residents enjoyed viewing films at majestic downtown movie palaces, many of which were crafted by renowned architects. For those who lived far from downtown, the expansion of streetcar and later motor coach lines out Woodward, Gratiot, Michigan and Grand River Avenues paved the way for the growth of many neighborhood and early suburban theaters. As these cities around the country were spreading out, then <clears throat> these perimeter areas, some of them became prime spots for deluxe theaters. Witness at the Fisher, the RKO Uptown, the Cinderella on the east side. The theaters were divided up. There were neighborhood theaters, downtown theaters and drive-in theaters. The downtown theaters were sort of dress-up events in those days. It was a place to really go out and one felt that he had to be dressed properly for the downtown theaters and they only showed first runs. The neighborhood theaters would receive movies after they left downtown and that's where we would go in groups. As a child it was every Saturday all the kids from the neighborhood would go en masse to the East Side Theater, later the Rialto. Economic and demographic changes of the 1950s and 1960s 
dramatically altered film exhibition in Detroit, as well as the movie-going experience. Following World War II, residents began leaving the city for homes in emerging suburban cities. By the mid-1950s, Detroit's once viable streetcar and interurban train systems were no more, as individuals relied on personal transportation to transport them to work and to their leisure time activities. During the second half of the 20th century, the movie-going experience changed significantly, as theater owners utilized gimmicks and new technology to woo patrons away from their televisions. The dish giveaway was probably the biggest gimmick that I, that I can recall. I'm sure there were others, but that was a big one. On dish night, everybody was holding their dish very, very tight. If, some, if one of the women would drop the dish, of course it would land on the floor with a big crash, everybody would clap. And I wasn't married at that time, so if I happened to go on dish night, I wouldn't take a dish. Well, that was practically sacrilegious. If you were a lady, you took a dish, but I never did. In Detroit, Fewer people ventured downtown for a movie, and suburban cinemas sprang up throughout the region. Downtown movie palaces either closed or were forced into showing genre films, including kung fu, horror, and slasher films. By the 1980s and 1990s, efforts to preserve and restore Detroit's movie palaces were well underway, with the reopening of the Fox Theater and efforts to restore the Redford Theater. Many neighborhood cinemas were closed as patrons increasingly visited multiplexes operated by large theater chains. Detroit, the real story, showcases the rich history of Detroit's vast network of theaters, large and small, chains and independents, ethnic and specialty venues, and little known cinemas from the early part of the 20th century through today's multiplexes. The exhibit also explores some of the extras from popcorn to 3D glasses that made the movie-going experience so memorable for millions of patrons. You have that experience that's outside the home and it's a communal experience and the film takes on a very, very different quality. And I think there has to be a difference in our industry between what is film and what is television. And, and I think that, that certainly something will be lost if these things go away and I think that we have a chance to go back to something again that people were really enjoying and, and, and make it new and fresh and better uh, and also uh, you know, bring back some memories in some people and create a new experience for, for another generation of people. The Detroit Historical Society presents Detroit, the real story. Enjoy the show. Now, Bill and Crystal Clark, who you saw in there, operated Clark Theater Service here in town for a number of years. They both met each other at the old Chandler Theater on Harper Avenue back in 1943. Uh, Crystal was working the candy counter and Bill was the theater manager and they eventually got married and started their own company because they both loved movies so much and at the height of Clark Theater Service they probably booked just about every indoor theater in Michigan, parts of Ohio and Indiana and just about every drive-in in Michigan. Uh, unfortunately Bill, uh, we lost Bill a couple of years ago. Uh, Crystal is still with us, still reviews the movies uh, keeps up with everything. She can tell you what movie played, what theater, how much it took in. It, it's amazing. Uh, two people who really love the business. Corey, uh, the last person that's interviewed, owns Phoenix Theaters, which is uh, one of our few independent uh, theater chains left. Um, we're pretty lucky in this area to have Phoenix Theaters, MJR Theaters, Imagine Theaters, um, all locally based because in so many communities around the country, they, everything's been gobbled up by the major chains. Uh, we are also one of the few cities left that still have what we call dollar houses or value cinemas. You can go to um, uh, Movie 16, where um, Universal Mall used to be, uh, and see movies. Uh, 
You can go to Macomb Mall, which is a silver cinema, which is operated by Landmark Theaters out of California. It's a value cinema. Uh, of course, the Civic in Farmington, which is owned by the city. Um, and then you've got the Penn Theater in Plymouth. Uh, MJR has the uh, Allen Theater in Allen Park, which is a you know dollar fifty house. So, uh, so we're really lucky to have those because most cities don't have anything like that anymore. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of images here too. I'll pass away oh, some unique things here too. Um, some of you are talking about remembering the Madison Theater, and of course last year the skyscraper next to the Madison, the David Broderick Tower reopened uh, as an apartment building after sitting vacant for about 25 years. Uh, Madison used to have a huge electric sign on the roof. The building itself still stands, but the auditorium was demolished in the early 2000s. This is the Telenews Theater, which was the last theater built in the downtown theater district, opened on Valentine's Day, 1942. And this was strictly a newsreel theater. Uh, this is where you went to see loved ones on the big screen. There was a teletype machine with all the latest news in the lobby. You could go downstairs in the basement to a lounge and pick up a copy of the Detroit Times, the Free Press, the news. WJLB also had a radio booth down there and broadcast live. This theater was so successful that they actually opened up another telenews theater up in the new center area near Woodward and Grand Boulevard. Uh, the building is actually still there, the one in New Center. It's a um, pay less shoe source today. The Cinema Theater, some of you might remember. This is actually today's gem theater. But in its heyday, from I'd say the late 1940s right on up through the 1960s, this was the theater to go to for art, independent, and foreign films. These are the folks installing those speakers I was telling you about for the uh, Michigan premiere of Fantasia at the Music Hall. A lot of you may remember the grand entrance of the Michigan Theater. Yes. <laughs> and of course, amazingly, even though this is uh, what the Brits like to refer to as a car park today, uh, this is where you drive in off the street if you were to see a tenant in that building today or if you were to tailgate for a Lions game. There's actually a three-level portable garage within the auditorium of this theater. Now the Family Theater was also another interesting venue right on Cadillac Square downtown. Uh, this goes back to about 1908, this theater. Uh, now, it switched over to, shall we say, art films in the 1960s, adult art films. And crazily enough, they never changed the name. They still called it the Family Theater. And it ended up going down in a blaze in 1973. Pipe organs were also a big part of many of these downtown theaters also. Um, the Michigan, the, uh, the Capitol, Fox, uh, the Palm State, Fisher, all had large Wurlitzer pipe organs. Uh, the Fox Theater still has its original Wurlitzer in the auditorium. They also have an auxiliary unit in the balcony. They also have a molar organ in the lobby where you come in off of Woodward. Redford still has its original Barton Theater installation, as does the Michigan in Ann Arbor. This happens to be the Wurlitzer at the Capitol when it opened. This organ actually then, in the 1950s, was dismantled and moved to the old Arcadia Ballroom. And then in the early 1970s to a private home. And then in the late 1970s, dismantled once again. And it's restored and it's in the Paramount Theater in Oakland, California today. And the original Wurlitzer from the Palm State actually ended up also in the Bay Area at the Castro Theater in San Francisco, where it's all been restored. Now, John, we're going to show another little clip here. This was done a year or so ago when the Fisher Theater celebrated its big anniversary. Uh, the Fisher, as many of you know, opened as a movie house. Uh, interestingly enough, all the money that was spent on the Fisher Theater, it, for the most part, it never was a first-run movie house. 
It was a second run movie house. They moved over pictures from downtown and even the stage shows were move over stage shows for a number of years because that was part of the uh, Paramount Publix chain, which also had the Capitol downtown. And the stage shows were called Publix stage shows, P-U-B-L-I-X. That was a name that Paramount used to brand their stage shows and also their Wurlitzer organs, like the supermarket chain in Florida, P-U-B-L-I-X. So uh, this was a little um, a video, it's only about three minutes long, to celebrate the anniversary of the opening of the Fisher Theater and the number of Broadway shows it's played through the years. Fisher Theater and Broadway in Detroit remains the fans. Thank you for bringing us to this golden milestone as we look ahead to another 50 years of fabulous and memorable performances.
here's what the fissure looked like when it was Aztec Mayan, and this is a stage show from the 1920s. The National Theater is another interesting theater, too. This is the only remaining theater building left on Monroe Street from the original theater district. This opened in 1911 for vaudeville, later switched over to movies, later switched over to burlesque, and then back to movies again. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen to this building. Obviously, this would have been a great project when Detroit Edison turned 100 years old to relamp all of those lights. Um, this is all beautiful glazed terracotta with poabic tiles, stained glass windows. Uh, the theater closed in the mid-1970s. Uh, briefly received a little bit of a respite during Super Bowl in 06. Uh, to clean up the facade. Uh, Dan Gilbert now owns most of this block. Uh, I know there's a, a plan afoot to try to have him save at least the facade of that theater. And that's from what year? 1911. So what street was it on? That's on Monroe. Mm -hmm. what, what is the National. The National Theater. Okay. This, is, uh, this is the Norwood. This is the theater that actually was switched over to another Telenews theater uh, on Woodward near the boulevard. For you East Siders, the Harper, of course, which still exists as Harpo's Nightclub. And it's also for sale today. Uh, for those that remember the Ramona on Gratiot at 6, here's the interior of the, of the Ramona. That was a little over 2,000 seats. The Vogue on Harper at Cashew was another favorite East Side theater. The East Town on Harper at Van Dyke. Talk about hard luck the last couple of years. A fire ravaged this building, scavengers, and then earlier this week, uh, scrappers got in there and removed the I beams above the ceiling, and the ceiling crashed in. So, Yep, that was a rock concert palace in the 70s. Cinderella on East Jefferson at the Bend was another big United Detroit house for a number of years. I mentioned the Hollywood on Fort Street. This was what, the biggest of all of our neighborhood houses with over 3,000 seats. Okay, now we've got one last video we're going to look at, and this is... Um, a little clip from a documentary about Cinerama. Uh, two young guys from Los Angeles who, who love Cinerama, research Cinerama, spent about a decade trying to pull this all together and restore some of the prints, because a lot of these prints from those pictures are disintegrating. And so that what they've been doing is digitally restoring the various Cinerama pictures. Uh, this is a 90-minute documentary. We're, we're going to show you just a little clip from it, give you a feel for it. Actually, if you buy How the West Was Won, you get this as a bonus feature. Um, but last year, they restored digitally um, two or three other Cinerama product, and there's two more that's going to be coming online this year also. And what they do is they, they premiere them at film festivals around the world, and then they release them to the public on DVD. So I know This is Cinerama is one of the ones coming out this year, and I believe uh, Search for Paradise is another one coming out this year. So we'll take about, uh, about a, uh, about a six-minute look at this. experience childhood memories that on occasion rush into our consciousness. A memory that has invaded my mind on numerous occasions was when I was only six years old and my parents took me and my sister on a special trip to St. Louis, Missouri. On the last day of this visit, we arrived at a very large ornate old movie theater. 
It was as if we'd walked into a sultan's palace out of the Arabian Nights. It was the Ambassador Theater, and it was specially set up for a new kind of motion picture event. Here, we were to be treated to an unusual giant screen movie that would lift us out of our seats and take us on a trip all around the world. I am not alone with this memory, for there were millions of children all through the 1950s and early 60s whose parents took them to one of those special theaters to see and marvel at these amazing travel adventures. Through the years, I've always wondered whatever happened to this old film process, how it started and how it finally faded away, and why it had had such an impact on me and others. So I decided to find out, and this documentary represents what I found. It is told mostly through the words of the people who were there, the engineers who developed it, the crew members who traveled the world filming with it, the performers and the exhibitors. People who are to this day still very passionate about its uniqueness. It's an American story, and it is their Cinerama adventure. The year was 1952, and America was experiencing the 40-hour work week, as well as buying new cars, moving to the suburbs, and contributing to the baby boom. Attendance at national parks doubled from 1948 to 1952. And then there was television. In 1949, there were 950,000 sets in the nation. But by 1952, the number had grown to 11 million and attendance at America's movie theaters had suffered drastically. The average weekly attendance in 1948 was 90 million. By 1952, it had slipped to 56 million. Hollywood studio executives were stumped as to what it would take to get their audiences back into the cinema. Meanwhile, in a large indoor tennis court in Oyster Bay, Long Island, a small group of engineers worked feverishly to rework a declassified World War II motion picture training device. Upon completion, the heads of all the major studios marveled at the impact of this new process, but soon rejected it as too complicated and impractical. Undeterred, the inventor and his team of filmmakers rented a large Broadway theater to premiere their new process. Little known to the film world, this process was about to change the face of motion pictures forever. It was September 30th, 1952, and they called it Cinerama. Hello everybody, Lowell Thomas speaking, welcoming you on behalf of Cinerama Productions as well as myself. You are about to see the first public exhibition of an entirely new form of entertainment. We call it Cinerama. It's a novelty, oh, but it's far more than that. It's the latest development in the magic of light and sound. The pictures you are now going to see have no plot. They have no stars. This is not a stage play, nor is it a feature picture, nor a travel log, nor a symphonic concert, nor an opera. But it is a combination of all of them. In fact, it is the first public demonstration of an entirely new media. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Cinerama. Well, that'll give you a little, uh, little sneak. I got a couple more here for, to show you the Beverly, which was a really cool Art Deco house on Grand River near Oakman. This is the interior of the Riviera when they were doing stage plays, uh, Grand River at Joy. It opened as a movie house, then they did plays, then back to movies, and then interestingly enough, 
in the late 60s into the early 70s, the Nederlanders had that house uh, and also put a lot of Broadway product into that theater. Does that still exist, the Riviera? It was demolished back in the early 90s. West Town Theater in Wyoming. Some of you are familiar with the Royal Oak, I'm sure. Sure. <laughs> the Redford. The Birmingham, which goes back to the 1920s. And it's interesting, when Uptown Entertainment took it over, luckily for everybody, they replicated the original marquee. This is the Uptown at Woodward and Six Mile. This was another theater operated by Howard Hughes. This was another big 2,000 seat theater. Unfortunately, about a decade ago, the auditorium was demolished, but the facade is still there. This is kind of a fun story, too. This is actually the premiere of Shane back in about 1953 at the Michigan. Um, Shane Sales, the gentleman on your right here, um, and Robert Solomon, they were students at Wayne State. They loved movies. They ended up bringing a picture, some of you might remember, Julius Caesar, about 1950 or so. Charlton Heston did this movie. No commercial theater in town wanted to touch it. It was a little too risque for them. So these guys rented the theater at the Art Institute to screen it and bought uh, all their own ads in the Free Press, the News, and the Times. And it was very, very successful. And as a result, they created their own agency, which actually still exists today in Bloomfield Hills. Shan, though, is, although he's very young here, is uh, in his early 80s in California today and still in the business owning theaters. He was also marketing director for United Detroit Theaters in the 1950s. Here he is with uh, Rock Hudson. Of course, this is back in the day when all the stars used to come to town. And his job would be to take them to the radio stations and the newspapers for interviews and then personal appearances at all the theaters. And here's Charlton Heston at the Michigan. And this was another premiere that he put together, The War of the Worlds at the Palm State Theater. So we want to take a few minutes for you to share your memories if, you, if you'd like to do that with the group. Your fa you might want to tell us about your favorite theater? Or? Not a favorite theater, but my mother was loved theater. Because she was born in 1891, so she, she, she came to Detroit to work. When she was 17, she often told me the noise in the city of buildings that were constantly being built, and she just loved movies. But what she really liked was at that time in the 40s, you didn't just see movies when you went, you saw the live bands. And that was, that's what I liked too, because you'd see the movie, the newsreel, the cartoon, <laughs> and then the band would come up from the bottom. That was, to me, that was really entertainment. Oh man, I wish, that's what I miss today. As everybody plays a banjo or a, a you know, but nobody plays a horn. That's what I used to like. I like, and I like the symphony too. But uh, I, I went Michigan, United Artists, Fox, my mother, and once a week we used to go downtown. And like I say, we didn't, my mother didn't drive a car, and I was too young to drive a car. But the streetcars were fine. <laughs> But the one theater that you'd never had a picture of but where I went was the Flamingo. A little bitty thing, and it wasn't much taken care of. And when you bought popcorn, you better eat it fast, and if you dropped any of it, the mice would go right over your feet and eat the popcorn. Pasadena. But we, I mean, it didn't, you know, we still went. My mother and I was walking distance, and we would bet the last picture my mom and I saw there was with Rita Hayworth was in it, but I can't remember. And I'm showing you how my mother movies. We went to that Friday and I got out of the school, high school, I'd take cheap go shopping during the day. I'd drag my books and go downtown on the bus and we ate our dinner. And we went to the show, and I don't remember that first movie, two movies, newsreel, you know. And then we walked out and that was at the United Artists. And we're walking by the Michigan, and there is that one I remember. Read the Wild Wind. 
Can we remember that crazy movie? And my mother says, oh, it's not that late. Let's go to this one, too. And I said, but Mom, it's after 7 o'clock by the time we get home. Because we had to take a bus and a streetcar. And she said, oh, that doesn't matter. She said, let's go. So I go in. We see this reap the wild wind, uh, which had this big about out in the ocean picture. Remember that? And uh, when we came out, she, my mother was just as spry as could be, and I came out with a massive migraine. <laughs> I mean, it was too much for my eyes, but it still it was, it was fun, and I remember those days. But I loved the bands, and you you could get up in the aisles and dance because it. You know, but everybody was from us. And everybody, like you say, dressed up. You really, really felt that it was different when you went there than when you were home going to school or, you know, working around the house doing housework. It, it, it just was, it was just such an entertaining thing to go. Yeah, it was an event. A lot of folks would combine going to the movies, going to lunch, shopping, spending right. a whole day, you know, downtown. Right. So, and like at the Fox too, for one price, not yeah. only, you know, like you say, you'd see the picture, you'd see Fox Movie Tone Newsreel, uh, you'd, the Fox also had its own ballet corps, its own orchestra, and its own version of the Rockettes, which were called yes. the Tillerettes, which were 32 precision dancers. Mm -hmm. And you know, like you say, the big bands at the Michigan, and then of course the Capitol, also had its own orchestra, the Capital Wonder Orchestra, which was a 40-piece orchestra. And then they also had a moving sidewalk on the stage. So actors uh, and actresses would, you know, act out the news events of the day, which of course in our case was a lot of automotive news. And then the Capitol also had Radio Schoolhouse of the Air, which was broadcast on WXYZ Radio every Sunday afternoon live from the stage. And that was uh, an American Idol type of contest of its day. There's one downtown, because I went to a couple of those, and I was pretty young, uh, maybe 12 or so. Was that the Broadway? It was, they used to have amateur hour. Mm -hmm. They, people could get up and try out, and they had a pretty nice orchestra that they could sing to, dance to, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember going to that, too. I was on a Sunday afternoon, I could have lots. But, uh, they, they were real entertainment. Uh, it, uh, it was something that uh, you had to live through to really enjoy it. And to, like you say, to appreciate the, the beauty of it. The last thing that we saw and uh, we went to the Fisher was uh, Julie Andrews. She did a live show. Boy, that was a great show she put on. Uh, and uh, we, my daughter bought seats for my birthday. If you were ten rows, you could. I mean, when she would sing, I mean, my daughter bought her, but she was I, I loved her. But her voice was the most perfect voice I ever met. A popular singing, um, excluding you know opera singers, she just had the perfect notes and no training. No, she didn't have any formal training. And after she had the operation on her throat, I mean, I really missed her voice. I thought it, it was so pleasing to the ear. <coughs> Go ahead. Uh, something about acoustics um, in, in the theaters in the early 1980s, the Detroit Symphony used the United Artists as a place to record things because it was superior sound. It was a wreck. I, I happened to be in the chorus at Don Wayne State at the time, and we did, uh, you know, sang to be on tape, but the the movie theater itself was in really bad shape. I don't know what its status is today, but it's in pretty sad shape. Uh, the it's two or three years ago, they put a new roof on the building to prevent any more water from coming in, but it's been ravaged by scavengers. Uh, but it could always come back. But economically, there has to be a need for it too. And quite frankly, we don't support today what we have. Uh, now, the United Artists, uh, there were actually three United Artists uh, flagship theaters built by the studio, Detroit, Chicago, and Los Angeles. Chicago's was demolished, which was right across the street from Marshall Fields on State Street. Interestingly enough, Los Angeles uh, played uh, Spanish language 
films into the 1970s and then became a home for a tele-evangelist. Unfortunately, he died several years ago. The theater sort of languished and now Aloft Hotels took over the entire building because it's also got an attached office building. So the office building just opened last month as a hotel and the theater's been restored and the hotel is using that as, as a banquet facility, concert hall and, and special events. So. You said the Tiger Stadium had in an opera menu at one time? When was that? That would have been in the mid 1930s, starting in 1935. It was called Opera Under the Stars. I just discovered my great grandparents lived somewhere within a few blocks of that, but I don't remember when. So I'll try to figure it out. See what you think of my opinion. I'm trying to think all of these big computers on the but my memory tells me. Architecturally, the interior of Michigan and the Fox were my favorite as the best. Do you agree with that? Makes yeah, most people that I've ever come in contact with that love theaters always felt that the Michigan was the most beautiful, which is sort of French Renaissance. Uh, everybody loves the Fox. Some people feel that it's a little too much because it's, it's such a mix. But the thing is, when you go to the Fox, every time you go to the Fox, you see something different. You know, whether it's jewels in the ceiling or in the eyes of the lions. Um, yeah, there's so much detail. But this is the interior. The building itself mm -hmm. is not, nothing elegant. Right. Anybody else want to share their memories? Go ahead, sir. I have a question. What, what killed Cinerama economics? Cinerama was very expensive to produce. Uh, there were also a lot of accidents making those films. There were uh, uh, so almost several fatal accidents in the making of How the West Was Won. So the combination of that and the expense. But what Cinerama did was it paved the way for widescreen pictures. Because act after Cinerama came out and became so successful, the other studios became very jealous. So 20th Century Fox came out with CinemaScope, Paramount came out with VistaVision, and then all the other studios <laughs> followed with their own visions. So in it paved the way for IMAX, yes. I have a question. With the advancement of television now and the flat screens, where do you see movie theaters or all these theaters within the next 20 years? Well, as you all know, this, this is, 2013 was the last year that the studios were actually providing theaters with 35 millimeter film. There's still gonna be a few pictures this year that'll be stragglers, but that's it. So theaters either had to get on board with digital or close. Obviously the multiplexes could do it because there's more, there's more volume there and more money. Um, small town theaters are the ones that have really been hurt. Most of the, the small town theaters that have wanted to go to digital uh, have had to go onto Kickstarter campaigns in order to raise the money because uh, even though it, the, the cost of digital projectors has come down, it, at one time it was well over $100,000 per projector. Right now it's between sixty-five and 75000 to install a digital projector. Um, and so a lot of these small town theaters, there's several of them up north that are uh, doing it right now. Um, the lucky ones, like the, anybody familiar with the Pines Theater up at Houghton Lake? C. Howard Crane, who did a number of our big downtown theaters, that was his last commission in 1940. You need to go, because it's probably the only theater in the country made of field stone and logs, pine logs. And when you go into this theater, it's mood lighting, and it's, you've got stuffed animals throughout the theater. That are, everything's indigenous to the North Country in this theater. Still family owned and operated, and they were able to go to digital last year as well. The Vassar, theater, also in the thumb, also was able to go digital. He really didn't want to do a Kickstarter campaign because he really felt, oh, I can't, I can't ask the people in my community to help me, you know, financially. But when push came to shove, he did it and he actually raised more. So that extra money is going to enhance other areas of the theater. There's also a theater in the UP right now that just started a Kickstarter campaign this month uh, to go digital, otherwise they'll have to close. So. You talked about dishes. Well, my older sister, who was married before the Second World War, will not 
she had a whole set. I mean, her sisters would go with you with her, her friends, you know, and I don't think she was the only one that did that. A lot of girls did that. So it was not just that they saw the movie, but you got the dishes to eat on the Bank night was another popular night uh, during that time also, where the banks would sponsor different nights and give away money and things like that. I remember a promotional thing, I think it was GM that did it, and it might have been CinemaScope, and they actually set up in a parking lot. Um, you know, it was enclosed enough that it could be dark, but it was a, a surround sound, ex sound and sight experience. I don't know if that uh, triggers any memories for anybody, but that would have been the early 60s, I think. You didn't mention drive-ins. Um, is there anything you want to say about drive-ins? Drive-ins? Well, there's not many of them left. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, obviously, Ford Wyoming yeah. here in town. Uh, the um, Capri drive-in in cold water is on USA Today's list of 100 top drive-ins in the country, uh, as is the Cherry Bowl up in Honor, Michigan, south of Traverse City which is a really cute drive-in, still family-owned and operated. Uh, and I think there's one, there's one in the Getty in Muskegon, maybe. I think there's one in Flint. But you can probably count on one hand how many are left in the state. I know there's one east of Toledo. John, do you know? Is it one or two? No, I don't remember which ones. I know some of them clear are gone. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the Starlight, the Franklin Park are gone. The drive-ins have even worse digital versus film problem because they have such a short, most of them short season. Some of the drive-ins are open year-round. Uh, they provide you with in-car heaters, so you have to run your your car. Uh, uh, I know the vehicle I had stereo. They we went to the stereo speakers in the car, stereo speakers. Uh, I worked summer jobs for four years, I guess. Three years, four years, four years. Worked summer jobs for four years at a company in Toledo that made driving theater speakers, driving theater heaters, one of the temporary, one of the biggest companies in the country, make that kind of equipment. So we assembled heaters and, and uh, speakers and so forth, and uh, uh, and also uh, box office equipment, cash counter, um, car counters, and machines like that. And so drivers were a huge business. Um, and it was a very family-oriented thing for the most part. They had uh, uh, playgrounds in many of the drive-ins. Um, one of the companies um, offered a complete playground set for drive-in theaters, a little train and some other rides that kids could ride on that the drive-in theaters could install, buy as a package and install at the drive-in theater. And you'd put the kids to sleep in the car and watch the, watch the movies. It was usually a double feature and an intermission, large concession stand, they sold uh, a lot of popcorn and pop and uh, things to eat in the cars. Um, so they were a very popular thing. But uh, so just recent, really recently, uh, many of them are going, the, the, few, many, the few that are left, a lot of those are going to close because they just can't afford the digital uh, equipment. They were only open four or five months a year unless, unless they're year-round operations. And uh, they, they just don't bring enough cash to do that. Did any of you ever sneak into a drive-in by hiding in a trunk or anything? That used to be a popular thing to do. Well, that's <laughs> drive Most drive-ins you go to, they would always have drawings. And the reason they had the drawings is the, the number for the drawing was on your ticket stub. And they wanted everybody to demand the ticket stub. And that's the way the owners kept count of uh, uh, the people that came in, plus the uh, equipment that we made and sold, the company I worked for, would display the amount that you owed so that the cashier couldn't charge, uh, charge it for four people and only put the money for one or two in the till. Uh, and they also, would, that was the other reason for the tickets, they would want to demand it. So that the people coming in the cars would demand the tickets. But yeah, speaking in the trunk of a car was very, very popular. I know somebody that snuck into a regular theater <laughs>
I assume the theater and donated all this to the needy people. So anyway, they got, got in with potato. With potato. Well, tell them the other story. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no, we used to sneak in some. He stopped mostly. Uh, sometimes downtown, a little more difficult. We had a group <laughs> that one person, one of the us, that was with my applicant. On the exit door. <laughs> so that was the old, that's illegal, I'm sure. Any, any police from here? Yeah. <laughs> well, that was one of the issues when multiplexes first came in to being, too, is there used to be a trailer that switching auditoriums is prohibited because people would switch, you know. They'd get sick of one movie, go to another one, or finish one and go to another auditorium. <laughs> If my, work, my sister was an usher right around 1939, 1940, right in there. She was, she was in high school, and uh, she worked at Harper. And I can remember a cranberry uniform that she wore. And that, I, I always liked it because she got to wear pants. And at that time, it wasn't too popular to wear pants, you know? <laughs> but I thought it looked really sharp. Because she used to, if you were a relative, you could go there free. She could take me in free uh, for the movie. And usually she was at the matinee and worked till maybe 9 o'clock. So she would take me uh, on a Saturday. I went a lot of times. But uh, I remember that real well. I was pretty young. <laughs> Anybody else before we wrap it up? Do you know the admission price, say, 1940 in the downtown theater? I don't know. Well, it depended on the theater. And it depended on, you know, if you had the features and the stage show and all that. It could be anywhere from 35 cents to 65 cents. Under a dollar. Okay. Yeah, under a dollar for sure. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Thank you.